Hello, my friends. Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. It is Tuesday, September 12th. And that reminds me that we will be at Dickie's Barbecue Pit this evening from 6 to about 8.30. Come join us if you can. It's great food and we have fun and I think you'll enjoy the music as well. We will be in Mountain View, Arkansas, uh, October 19th through the 22nd. If you'd like to join us down there, well, just shoot me an email, rosastringworks at gmail.com, and I will get back to you with a text number that you can text us while we're down there. And let's see. Progress on the mandolin. Getting straight into business here. We have made some. It's back in one piece. I put the uh, fretboard back on it yesterday, and uh, that was simple. As you know, I'm often sarcastic. It it was easy. It's just that I tried to shortcut it and the shortcut didn't work like usual. So in other words, I did have to put the little pins in here to keep it from sliding. It just slid. It would not stay still. How anybody else is able to do that without putting pins in there or, you know, the people that use salt. I wouldn't use salt. But anyway... You have to do something to keep them from sliding. You get two flat planes together, you put glue on it, and they'll slide like this every single time. The more pressure you put on them, the more they slide. So you really have to do something to lock that in when you glue that on there. Otherwise, you'll come back in the morning and you'll find that your fretboard is on there at a, a skew. Let's say it that way. Use that fancy term. It's a skew. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. Okay, well, I uh, the uh, real sharp viewers, if you could see past me, could tell that uh, things have changed behind me here. Got a different toolbox sitting there. Now, that toolbox, I didn't buy that new. I had it in the metal shop, and it was really too small for the application I was using it in there. And so what I did was, you think, well, I changed it with this toolbox. No, I didn't. The toolbox that was sitting here, I moved it over there. Can you see over there? Yeah, it's sitting right there now. And the toolbox that was in the other room, that's this one. I brought it in here and I took uh, another toolbox that was just like the one that used to be here and I put it in there. It, the other toolbox only had plans and... Um, uh, binding and things like that in it and I'm not using that that much anymore so I took that in there and put all my uh, lathe tooling in that toolbox and moved the lathe tooling toolbox here and now I'll show you a video of what's in this so here is your first video this morning of three we have three videos to show you well my friends I didn't make a video on creating my charging station but you can see I took a U.S. General uh, toolbox that I got from uh, Harbor Freight. And uh, this is uh, kind of like a tool cart, really. And I have some other just miscellaneous junk stored down on that bottom shelf for right now. But up here on the top, I have everything I need to charge for the most part. Here's my DJI Pocket 2 camera. It's got a weird uh, charging cord plugged into it right now. You can probably see it pulsating there. And let's see, we'll just start from uh, right and go to left. Here's a, a wireless microphone for this camera. This is a uh, battery for a Canon camera, like I've used in the past. These are four batteries for my drone. Here is the GoPro camera that I was going to sell and decided not to sell at the last minute. This is a bat extra battery for that. I've ordered a charging uh, block for this so I can charge two batteries at once. This is the controller for the drone. This is a hub that uh, has multiple USB ports on it. Um, here's a hub that has a couple of ports. And then this power strip itself has a couple of ports. All the ports are being used. Over here, I've got uh, uh, the Rhodes wireless microphone system that also works with this camera. In fact, this really works the best. Um, so I've got two wireless microphones and one receiver here. So these are the transmitters. I think that covers everything that's in that top drawer, and you can see it's pretty darn full. Um, 
let's see i'm going to take this out of there and put it down in one of these accessory drawers these are just accessories here just some extra cords and different things more accessories these accessories are all geared towards this uh, particular camera then let's see down here in this drawer uh, again mostly just accessories these are mostly for the gopro and then down here, I have an extra Canon camera. I think this one is slightly damaged. It works, but there's some issues. Um, here's a remote for one of the Canon cameras. And a few more accessories. This, this is all drone stuff over here. So that's about it in terms of all the camera and drone stuff and microphone stuff. But uh, you can see I've got quite a bit of stuff, and that's why I needed to find one place to consolidate all of it, because it was just a nightmare keeping up with everything. And now it'll be much better. And uh, I see the camera's pointed up a little bit. I'm going to pull it down just a little bit here. Well, I thought I would, but uh, it's got other ideas. Okay, that works better. Um uh, in addition, just a while after I made that video this morning for you, I uh, also started noticing I had all these little memory cards, you know, the little cards that you insert in there uh, to hold the photographs and the videos, etc. I had tons of those laying around, so I put all those in the little accessory drawer there too. So now I got everything in one spot, and that that is helpful when you're doing as much as I'm doing. Um, so that was the uh, charging station. I've got a little video again on the pond, but this time it's uh, related to the grass. So take a look at this. Well, I thought I'd show you the pond again this morning, and this time the reason is the grass. If you look, you can see the green grass coming up already. Sue has done a good job getting the grass sowed on this, and it won't be long till there'll be a full uh, green, pond dam all the way around here this uh, dam is much different than most ponds and that it pretty much is a 360 dam and it's uh it, it's not quite it's it really doesn't i mean the dam ends there and it ends over there but uh, it, really there's just one straight wall typically the uh, straight is the dam <laughs> and there and the round part is usually the pond this pond is kind of built backwards from that and I would assume that's just because they decided to build it here on this hillside that would have been a hillside just sloping down to the creek. And they've got the spring up there, and they figured they'd just use the spring to keep a pond full, and that's what they did here. Um, it was built long before my time, but I restored it. It really was in horrible shape when I bought this place. In fact, it wasn't even approachable. You couldn't even get close to the water. There was so much uh, trees and brush grown up around it you couldn't even get near the water it was unbelievably grown up and it took me years to get it to stop leaking I think we've accomplished that now so I'm anxious to move on to the next part of my project which would be the water wheel over there and in the next day or two whenever it dries up a bit because it has been sprinkling here a little bit overnight but whenever it dries up a bit I'm going to get up there and dump some rock and use that plate compactor and make a video of that. Yeah, that uh, pond is turning out really nice and I think the improvements we're making are going to be really nice and uh, can't wait to get into that next phase and I know you guys are more anxious even probably than me but uh, I'm going to get there. My t-shirt by the way today is Kamita Systems. That's the Italian boy that uh, was my exchange student when he was in high school and he has that company now he inherited it from his uh, late father and uh, it's a uh, high-tech company uh, where they uh, build um, oh biofeedback equipment it's wireless equipment and it's the only one in the world that works underwater in other words swimmers can wear this and uh, it sends biofeedback to the uh, back to the uh, receiver unit Pretty cool technology, and uh, he's a smart man, and he travels all over the world all the time. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's see, the plate compactor. I noticed somebody made a comment already. It says, uh, Eddie Wolfie says, Hi, folks from Sterling, Scotland. Hope you have a big pile of dishes to test the plate compactor. 
<laughs> yeah, I I just think that that's a revolutionary idea, you know. <laughs> Instead of doing dishes, just compact them. <laughs> uh, anyway, here's a, here's a little more on the plate compactor. Here you go. Well, my friends, I've opened up my package here, my plate compactor from Horrible Fright, otherwise known as Harbor Freight. You can see it came with a lot of extra parts, which I'm impressed, but it also makes you wonder, uh-oh, <laughs> is something gonna fail? I mean, it's almost like you're suspicious. It came with uh, extra carburetor parts. Here's like an extra hose that I think is either for fuel or for air breathing. I'm not sure what that one's for. This is a spark plug wrench, which is kind of handy. Came with a, a oil filler or an oil funnel. It came with a spare air cleaner. I've already checked, the air cleaner is installed. There's two extra belts. I didn't check on the belts because this thing is so contained that you can't get to it. So I'm assuming there's a belt on there and those are just extras. This one came with a wheel kit also. Let me show you. It has a, a nice wheel kit, which is kind of cool. You just, you can just pull this deal right here, drop the wheels down, you tilt the machine up, and the wheels roll under. Now you can lean it back on the wheels and roll it around like a wheelbarrow. Pretty cool, because it's heavy, you know, it's a plate compactor. So we'll take the wheels back off here. It says you have to put oil in it, of course, that's the first thing, and, and that's true for any engine. You don't want to run any engine without oil. And this is a semi-synthetic 10W40. It says that oil should be level with the bottom of this hole, basically. So it can, you can pretty much check it visually by looking. I'm sure the directions probably tell you, but, you know, who would want to read destructions? I mean, instructions. I've uh, worked on enough small engines in my life to pretty much know the routine here. I think that might be it right there. That's three quarters, three quarters of a quart. That's probably full. Let me, let me just see if it's really full. I think it is. Yeah, it is. It's kind of, it's running out there just barely. I mean, like just drip, barely a drip coming out. So that's perfect. This is a Kawasaki oil made for small four-stroke engines, so it should be perfect for this. In case you're wondering about the semi-synthetic. Let me get some gas and uh, we'll fill this up. I, I'm trying to get this little filter out of the gas can tank just to look down in there to make sure I don't see anything you know, like problems in there. I wouldn't think I would, but just wanting to make sure before we fill it up. We'll put a little gas in there and see how that goes. Try to do it without spilling a lot. And of course, the neck on this thing's dripping. It normally doesn't drip, but it will because we're in the shop, of course, and because we're on camera, these cans usually don't drip. But it's dripping today. That's full enough. All right, let me try to clean up my mess. Well, as you can see, I uh, haven't started this thing yet, so uh, I have no idea how it's going to start. I can see here we got a min and a max. That would be the max, I guess. That would be the min. I'll go just a notch off of that. Well, let's do the choke thing and the fuel off. It's it's in, already on in the on position, so we good there. Let me double check this throttle. Yep, the throttle does work down here. All right, so we'll leave it about there. Okay, I've got the switch turned on. Got gas in it, got oil in it. Everything's ready to go. And let's see if it'll start. As you can see, it starts 
and runs really well. Okay, well now I know that I want to have the throttle all the way down when you start it. I figured that was probably the case anyway, but I didn't know that. Now we know that for sure. Otherwise it starts to vibrate. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to vibrate and pack the soil down. It's very heavy. Um, yeah, it's got a lifting point here, but I can't really lift it off the ground very easily. I'm sure I could get it off if I had to, but it's very heavy. So I think that thing's going to do the job. Starts easy, looks good. Should be able to wheel it around at least inside the concrete floor shop. And I'm good with everything. Yeah, I'm overall happy with that purchase. It's a little expensive. And yeah, I could rent them. But you know, when you see, I'm all about the hassle factor. And I'm seriously telling you, and you've heard me say it before. If it's a hassle, I don't do it. And, you know, renting equipment here is kind of a hassle because you got to go 20 miles one way to town to get it and 20 miles back. So there's a 40 mile round trip. Then you got to do that 40 mile round trip again to take it back. And, uh, you know, the rentals are expensive these days. So, you know, I don't know what that would rent for, but let's just say it's a hundred bucks. And, uh, you know, you rent that a couple of times. It don't take long to pay for it, especially when you're with your time and your gas and all that. So to me, buy the doggone thing. I've got several projects I can use it for and, uh, you know, use it and abuse it. That's my motto. <laughs> well, actually, that's Sue's motto. <laughs> Pretty much everything she uses, it gets abused. But uh, she does a lot of work with it, though. She gets a lot of stuff done. So, anyway, uh, let's see here. I've got a couple more quick things. Um, there was a, um, I have a link in the description of this video to a thickness sander uh, build that a guy, uh, uh, he gave us, he gave me and Caleb shout outs. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, there's a link to that in there. And so it just says thickness sander and you can watch his video. It's, it's, Kind of a long video. He does do a lot of extra talking, I think. So you can kind of skip through some of that and get to the uh, part that you want to see. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, I just say thank you to that fellow for at least uh, acknowledging uh, my channel here and uh, giving me the shout out. So thank you very much. And let's see, uh, there, I also have a link in the description to a little child genius. Now we've all seen these kinds of videos and stuff. But this little guy, he's five, this video, I think the video was actually filmed a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was like 2017, actually. Um, so more than a couple of years ago now. That just seems like yesterday to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was five years old at the time. And he's about as cute as he can be. And let me tell you, this little guy is a absolute 1,000% genius i mean like he, you you see all these kids and they you know they you know, first of all the guy the, the guy doing the interview he says uh well you know what are you interested in he go, or what what's your favorite subject or something like that and he says well math you know and so the guy gives him one of these ma math problems i thought he was going to give him a math problem like you know what's 125 times you know 48 or something i thought he was going to do something like that no <laughs> He gives him a, a real problem. And this kid, just like Einstein, man, he's he's charting it out. <laughs> and it just goes on. And you can tell this little guy knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. He's amazing. He's flat amazing. He's probably the most amazing little genius guy I've ever seen. And he's just, like I said, he's just as cute as a button, man. I mean, he is so cute. So just take a watch at that. Now, it's it's a long video, long interview, but he gets into uh, math. He gets into um, uh, chemistry and he gets into physics. Uh, and, and so there's separate sections for each of those. And then he, then they do a flashback to the year before interview. So he's like, he's only four on the flashback. So anyway, the point is, you know, just take a look at it. You'll, you'll get a kick out of it and you can skip through a lot of it. I, that's what I did. I couldn't, it's over my head. I couldn't bear to sit there and watch it and listen to him explain it, you know. But he is, like I said, it's it's worth watching just to see how cute this little guy is. He's just one of the cutest little kids you'll ever see. 
and uh, he is one smart little boy. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, uh, just like me. He's just one smart little boy. <laughs> I can't even say that without laughing. Um, yeah, I, I almost flunked kindergarten. Let's see. Thomas Armstrong. Good morning, Jerry. Saw Caleb's antler sadio, uh, <laughs> ant sad video. So it looks like it's a... I don't know. Anyway, he, it's an abbreviation. It's antler saddle video. Got me to wondering if they have band saws that stop instantly if your finger comes into contact. No, I don't think there is such an animal. Um, and you know what? Those, those are expensive machines. You know, those table saws that do that, it ruins uh, so much of the saw when it does that. And, and it's expensive. It's hundreds of dollars. And you guys say, well, yeah, but you saved your finger and that would have been more than hundred. And you're right. So, I mean, it's good and bad, but man, you know, it, it, I would hope they could find a way to make that a little less expensive because, I mean, if it could accidentally kick off, you know what I'm saying, and cost you hundreds of dollars. So, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's good and bad. But, you know, you can only be so safe. And I've done woodworking my whole life. I still have all my digits. I've done... Tons of other stuff that's way more sketchy than woodwork. <laughs> and I still have all my digits. Yeah, I've gotten my share cuts. In fact, I, a long time ago, I tried to count all the scars. I can, you can't even see the scars anymore. I think getting old, you know, it's all changed. But uh, I can still see a lot of scars. And I, I counted, um, I think, over 70 scars on each hand. And you know, some of you will think that's horrible. But you know what? If you do the work that I do all the time and constantly doing work, it's going to happen, you know. But you just, you got to cut your losses and try to do, you know, use your common sense and try to watch and not really hurt yourself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a cut here and there is going to happen. But uh, anyway, I, I've had my share. I can tell you that for sure. But uh, but but you're right on the bandsaw, by the way, though, that the bandsaw is really dangerous for taking off fingers. Oh, man, they're super dangerous for that. It's way more dangerous, in my opinion, than the, than the table saw, because what happens is you take it for granted. And, and I know there's you guys have heard me say this before, but we you got to remember, we always have new viewers. And so pretend this is a board and you're pushing this through the, the the blade and the blade is like this and it's a little bitty thin blade and you don't hardly see anything moving i mean it's just a little thin blade in a line you know and you it doesn't like the big table saw it's going you can hear the wind going around on the blade and you can see that big blade with those big teeth just whirling so you're you're kind of afraid of that and you pay attention to that generally speaking most people do but this thing is just, you know, it's just going down like this and you don't pay attention. And what people do often is they'll be pushing like this with their thumb behind the idea, the object they're pushing. And then when it gets, and they're thinking they're going to stop, I think. But the thing is that when it cuts through that last piece, it jerks forward because of the pressure. And it just cuts your thumb right off. And I was explaining that to my daughter one night when she was in the shop and she was using my bandsaw. And there was a man in the shop. Uh, I was working on his instrument at the time. And uh, I, I explained that exactly to her before she used it because I didn't want her to cut her thumb off, you know. And the man says, he ain't lying. He holds up his hand. <laughs> He's missing his thumb. He sawed his off on a bandsaw. At least that's what he told me. I'm assuming he was telling the truth. He could have just been doing that for dramatic effect, and maybe he lost it in a car door for all I know. But but that's what he said anyway. So, yeah, it is very dangerous. you got to be careful with uh, bandsaws. So that's my public service announcement in this video for today. Watch out for your bandsaws because they will take off your digits and really do it very quickly. Um, Let's see. And they never say I'm sorry when they're done either. <laughs> Mike Saba has a question. Jerry, why why did you decide to keep your GoPro? Uh, yeah, that, that camera. Well, the truth is, 
it was a $400 camera and, and I had a, a minimum bid of 290. It was only bid up to 275 at like on, I don't know, hours before the end of the auction. And I figured, well, somebody's just going to come in and give me the very minimum bid. I thought, honestly, I really thought there'd be more action on it. I really thought there'd be some bids. I didn't expect to get my 400 back, but I thought, well, I'll get at least 300 back or maybe 350 or something like that, you know, and it's still a good buy for somebody who wants a brand new GoPro camera. That didn't happen. So it was still at 275 just hours before the auction ended. And I thought, well, rather than just get totally ripped off, I'll just stop it and keep it. And quite honestly, the video that came out of it is very high quality video. It's really good video. So I thought, you know, I can still use the doggone thing. I'm just not happy with the design of it. I really think they should hang their head in shame. As long as they've been doing this, they can do better. And that's just the bottom line. There, there's so many little stupid things about that camera that could be so much better and were even better before and they've screwed them up. That's what really makes me mad. You, you take a decent design and all you really got to do is do, maybe do one more thing to make it like perfect design. And they went the other way. They, they changed four or five things that just make it just, just junk, just ridiculous. It's not that it doesn't work. It works perfectly fine. It's just an, an annoying uh, design issue to me. And I'm all about design. You've heard me say it before. There's no excuse, absolutely zero excuse for a poor design. Zero. None. I don't accept any excuse. I don't accept a, be a poor design on my own self. If I build something, you know, and, and it's a poor design, well, I admit it and I change the design and fix it, you know. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So it was just to keep from getting totally ripped off is all. I, you know, um, let's see here. I'm looking for question marks. I, I, there's one here, Mike C, but it doesn't have any question marks, but it looks like it has something about the dump truck, so I'm going to read that real quick. Bear with me. I'm a slow reader. A little late today, I was prepping a meatloaf for the smoker. By the way, impressive job straightening out the uh, dump truck. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, you've been, you'll see that in a video, I think, if assuming the video turned out, how I straightened that. And I had scratched my head on that thing quite a while because I couldn't come up with a way to hold it. It, You know, holding it is the problem. Um, the actual torquing of it and twisting of it, I I'm, was fairly sure I could do that if I could find a way to hold the darn thing. So that was the tough part. But anyway, I fi finally figured it out. And uh, Paul Lanier says, uh, Good morning, folks, from Red Stick on the mighty, muddy Mississippi. Have a great day. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Lester Cunningham uh, he doesn't have any question marks, but he says, Morning, Jerry. So glad you're here for us. Thank you so much. Makes my day. Well, God bless you too, Lester. I appreciate that very much. Jared Pelfrey's got a long one here. Hey, Jerry, what's a good way to hammer a free high fret down over the body of an acoustic? My new hummingbird has a high fret at 15 or 18. Well, um, that's a good question, and there's a, a couple of options because there, there could be a couple of problems. First of all, I would take your finger and see, can you move it? If you can move it, and up and down and actually go down in the slot and it pops back up. If you can do that, then, you know, you're not going to be able to fix it easily just by hammering it back down. It's just not going to stay. So what you want to do in a case like that, if it is, if it's that free, then you're going to want to put uh, CA glue in there. And what I would recommend is that you actually either just hold it uh, in down while the CA glue is setting and you might you know like I've told you before if you if you wait on the CA glue before you spritz it with the accelerator it won't turn white and it won't bubble up so like my th thought process would be to put a little CA glue on both sides push it down like with a screwdriver or something just something that you can hold on the fret to keep it down and wait about five to ten seconds and then spritz it lightly with the accelerator and it won't turn white on you that way. And just keep holding it for another 
30 seconds or so just to you know because if it's got a lot of spring in it it's going to want to come up and just give the give the ca glue time to set so if that if you can do that and you can move it well then like i said you're going to need to go the ca glue route now if you can't move it and if it does seem like it's going to be tight down in the slot then you can you have the option of putting a little ca glue in there anyway which is not a bad option but you can drive it in there and what i usually do and, and you don't this is optional but this way i do it let me see if i can find my piece here um might not be able to find it I haven't used it in a while and of course when you don't use something in a while it, it gets mad at you and it runs off but what i do is i take like a little um piece of aluminum like this and, and you know this one here you can see it's even got a little bit of a, a ridge in it there where uh and then like I, I lay that on top of the fret like that and then I hit that with a hammer and uh, you can move this along the fret and tap it lightly and that way you don't create any damage to anything you know and this aluminum is a little bit softer than the fret but not very much and it I've pounded thousands upon thousands of frets with this thing and you can barely see any mark in it I mean it's just barely got a little bit of an indention so it's hard enough to do the job and um, if you don't, I mean, if you have a plastic hammer, you know, a weighted, this is a weighted plastic hammer for doing leather work, actually. And that's what I typically use. And it works really good. Uh, you can just use a regular hammer of any kind to do it. But, but you can also use this because it's plastic. You can use this directly on the fret, too, if you need to. So those are the options that I would tell you off the top of my head and generally those two things are going to work for you but uh, the ca glue may be necessary in any case you may just need to do that um, it's not a bad and it's not a big deal you can still pull them right back out whenever you need to pull them out uh, even with the ca glue in there uh let's see let's move down to the last one or maybe that was the last one i think it is yep it was okay well i think that's it um Oh, uh, Jared uh, went on to say he was talking about a few, not free. Well, the free was what threw me there because if it is free and it moves up and down, uh, you definitely need CA glue. But either way, it's not bad to put CA glue on there if you've got to drive. If they've come loose, they probably came loose for a reason. More than likely, they aren't tight enough anyway, so putting the CA glue in there is not a bad option anyway. The only caution that I give you with the CA glue is really be careful because if it runs down and around and around your, you know, behind the neck, and it can, you know, if you get a little bit too much CA glue in there, it'll run out the end of the fret and then down around underneath the neck and make a mess. So be very careful with the CA glue. But uh, yeah, you, CA glue in instruments is great, but man, you got to be careful. Uh, it really can create a problem. So, you, you know, if you're not used to doing it, it might be advisable to put masking tape along your neck on the bottom side, you know, where the, if the CA glue did run around, it would be on the tape. So you might want to do that if you're just not used to doing it. Because trust me, believe me, it can happen before you know it happened. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just telling you for sure that can happen absolutely can happen and you think well no i can control that well you'd be surprised <laughs> you'd be surprised it will it'll sneak up on you um wade hampton good morning jerry i've been a uh, fan of your channel for several years we are about the same age and i have learned a ton of things from you i wholeheartedly support your retirement well thank you wade i really do appreciate it and as i said in yesterday's vlog if there's anybody here that didn't see that um, i made the right decision because like i said i worked on uh, two guitars over the weekend for my buddy bill pilliard and man the whole time the hands were just screaming you know they were screaming there it wasn't like a little pain it was really serious pain and it was like man i couldn't do this all day anymore there's no way i could not a chance so you know the hands don't hurt that much while i'm not doing that kind of work but for whatever reason and i think it's because that you know you know you just, you get 
that part of my hand and that those muscles and those tendons and those joints are, are wore out. I mean, you know, to get them into that shape that you need to do the kind of work I was doing. It occasionally hurts doing other things, but it doesn't hurt like that. I don't know. It's just, I, I made the right decision and I stick by it. I'm not, I have nothing, you know, I have no regrets that I quit because it's, it was time. It was definitely time. Uh, Marigold Time, greetings from Sweden. Remember to hit the like button. Well, thank you, Marigold, and I hope everybody will hit the like button. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, three little short videos. I will probably put the plate compactor video out in a separate video later, but probably not until after I've actually used it and show that at the end of the video. So I will probably uh, put that out as a, sh not exactly what you call a video short, but you know, a short video. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll do that later on. It'll probably be a, a while yet. And I also, the last thing is that I do also need to get the video out on that, uh, that in, inside um, laser level. Uh, I told them I would do a video on that. And I've got a little project in mind uh, in the other shop over there that I'll probably make a video and use it over there. And you'll see that coming out in the next, probably within the next week or so. So that's about everything I have. I saw one more scroll up here, so I'm just going to check real quick. Paul Furmeister, good morning, Jerry. Do you only use boiled linseed oil on your guitars? Yes, boiled linseed oil is all I ever use. I don't think the other linseed oil dries. I don't think it does. I think you have to use the boiled I'm not 100% sure that that's true, but there's some, there is a difference and I forget what the difference is. I think it's that it never dries or it takes forever to dry if you don't use the boiled. So anyway, and, and I'm sure there's additives in the boiled that the other doesn't have. So that's the bottom line. But anyway, good luck uh, on using it because it is good stuff. And I do recommend boiled linseed oil to kind of go over old cracked finishes and old, you know, like old violins. If you just wipe them down with that stuff and then wipe it back off, you want to dry it back off with a dry cloth after you put the linseed oil on. Um, at least if, if it's a, uh, uh, you know, a, an instrument that's already finished and you're just fixing cracks and checks and you know chipped out places and you put the boiled linseed on make sure you dry it back off now on a instrument that has no finish at all that's a little different story but you still don't want to leave it on in uh, you know you don't want to leave it on thick even on that okay that's it thanks guys we will we'll see you tomorrow come to dickies if you can mm -hmm.